Hello everybody, welcome back. Many of you have been asking me for a bass processing tutorial. Now that's something I wouldn't normally cover on this channel, as I'm trying to focus on the music, not the engineering. However, just like in my video about tuning kicks, we can sometimes find a little bit of musical knowledge will help with the science. So this is a video of two halves. First of all, we'll get the science bit done and I'll show you the musical approach to that. Then I'll give you some tips on what I call flavor processing. Let's go. Okay, let's do some bass science. <laughs> First, we'll get the fundamental principle out of the way and then let's discuss how to approach that from a musical angle. Let's discuss energy. That's a term DJs are familiar with, right? Energy levels of different tracks versus other ones, energy of the audience, etc. Allow me to introduce pink noise. The idea behind pink noise is that it has equal energy at every frequency. You'll see it has a downward slope. And what this is telling us is, the lower in frequency we go, the more sound it takes to produce the same amount of energy. And the second thing we need to understand is I would like you to imagine this total amount of energy as a pool. This is our total energy pool. Now, this is important because in the digital domain, we have this fixed ceiling, right? We can't go above it. So this total pool of energy is shared everywhere. If we mess up down here, if we expend too much energy down there, it's going to take away from somewhere else. Okay, that's all very well looking at noise, but what about real music? Well, if you look at the spectrum of our track here, and this doesn't just apply to dance music, by the way, this is most music, you'll find this typical downward slope. So in simple terms, bass takes up loads of energy. <laughs> and also we only have so much total energy to work with. So how do we deal with bass parts? Right, well, the first method is called sub separation. Other tutorials have covered this method, but what most of them miss is it works best when you know the track's key. So anyone who's watched the last few videos will know this particular bass line's key is in E. But what if you're working with a sample? What if you don't know the key? Or even if your bass sample has a key label on it? We don't know that that is correct. Many of them are not. What we can do is use a frequency analyzer, just like we did earlier, but on the bass part alone. And what we're looking for is these spikes, these bumps. These are the harmonics that make up our sound. So the first spike is what we call the fundamental. That's your first harmonic. That's your actual note. So as you can see up top there, it says E1. 41 hertz, that's 41 vibrations a second. So we need to take note of that. And then the other thing we need to find out is the next harmonic. Usually in most sounds, it's one octave above, which is double the frequency. So in this case, 82 hertz. So 41 and 82. Obviously, this is all dependent on the key of your track. These numbers change with every key. So that's why we need to know the key of the track. Don't copy these down if you're not in E. So now what we do is we separate our bass into two tracks. You can see here I have one track which is simply playing a sine wave of trusty old Vital. As you can see, sine wave at 41 hertz. There's our sub bass part. And then for the main bass sound, we separate that off. You can see we've used a high pass filter, any will do. So we need to pick somewhere between the 41 and the 82. So we're just separating off 82 and above. You can see I've grabbed somewhere around 60, 63, etc. here. We don't want to be exactly on 82 because that might cause interference. High pass filters do cause phase shifts after all, and those are the enemy of bass. So those are now separate. And the whole reason we do this is so that we have individual control over the lowest octaves of our bass and can treat them differently. Now to understand why we need that control, we need to understand a little bit of how kick drums work. If you haven't seen my video on tuning kicks, I thoroughly recommend it. 
But what you need to know is kick drums contain different frequencies at different times. For example, the high frequencies in a kick drum are mostly right at the beginning. That's what gives them that initial attack, that click, that bite. Then after that, as they descend in pitch, we have what I call the chest area, the thud, the bit that hits you in the chest. That's in the low mid kind of area. And then the longest lasting frequencies are the lowest ones. You can see almost on the spectrum here, this downward trend. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Right, from high to low. So the longest frequencies are the sub-frequencies at the bottom, taking up the most energy. Now, because we have separate control over the sub-frequencies in our bass, we can make sure they don't interfere with the sub-frequencies in the kick drum for that length of time. We can do that with a volume envelope plugin like this. And as you can see for the upper bass part, we can treat that differently. So how long does the sub-bass need to stay out of the way for? Well, there's a nice simple trick I can show you. If we place this same plugin on our kick drum, we can use the waveform readout to see its length. And you can see our kick drum in this track is ending just past halfway. So if we make sure our sub bass is out of the way for that length of time, we now know the sub frequencies are not going to be fighting for that precious energy pool. Now we should never just rely on the eyes. Look up a phenomena called the McGurk effect if you want to know why, but we need to do a listening test too. And a great trick for those of you in less than ideal environments is just to put the filter on the master and listen to the low frequencies only. What we call the club toilet test, right? <laughs> And what we're listening for here is, is this a big boomy mess? Or can we still dance to this? Can we hear the groove? Hopefully you can hear in this case, our bass and kick groove is working. Let's see how this changes when I remove the sub side chain. Let's take the side chain off the bass. Can you hear how everything is now fighting for the space, for that energy? So both very important. Now, if you couldn't hear the difference in those examples, then that is an indicator that either your ear training or your listening environment is going to need some work still. Right then, that's the science bit out of the way. Get that bit right and you're free to do pretty much anything you like afterwards. Now, if you were hoping for some magical mix trick, I'm afraid you've already missed it. This and the video before should be all you need. You need to get the bass sound right. Then you need to get the bass part right. You need to understand groove, etc. And then when you understand the distribution of energy down there, that's everything you need to get the track working. Everything after this point is just aesthetic preference. Let me show you some simple ways that I add flavor. Okay then, let's talk about stereo stuff. Now, this is only for those of you working with mono bass, like the patches I provided in last week's video. If your bass is already stereo, then first of all, check it in mono, make sure it doesn't collapse. If it's fine, then skip this section. If not, keep it in mono, and I'll show you how to make it stereo better than the original person did. Any of you who've tuned into my live streams will know how much I rant about mono compatibility. Yep, this mono check button needs to be available to you at all times. The reason is simple. Most of your listeners, who are not headphone users, will be listening in mono or near mono. Many Bluetooth speakers, soundbars and TVs say they're stereo, but are actually near a mono. The speakers are never far enough apart to produce true stereo. Also live, 
Many live venues and clubs play back in mono because of the opposite problem. The speakers are too far apart. We don't want the person stood by the right-hand speakers getting a completely different experience to those stood by the left. So just in case, we have to make sure the most crucial elements of our track, bass being one of them, will survive in mono. So I prefer to start with a mono bass and then widen, as opposed to starting with a stereo bass and hoping it survives. It's too crucial for that. I'm going to show you three methods I typically use in ascending order of usefulness. The first way most people will know as the name Dimension Expander, because that's what it was called in the synth that popularized the effect, Massive by Native Instruments. Now all this effect is under the hood is just basically a ping pong delay. Two quick delay repeats, one pan left, one pan right. So we can make this in any delay plugin. You just need to put it in ping pong mode. So it pings from left to right. And also no feedback or repeats. Or else that happens. And then we need to make sure our delay is set to milliseconds, not tied to the tempo of the track in beats. And we want to keep it in what's called the Haas range, which is typically below 30 milliseconds. And different delay spacings are going to affect your sound in different ways. So have a play. And without. Now this kind of widening of mono sound is the least stereo compatible, so do check. Because it's literally adding echoes to your bass. And as we know for bass sounds, moving anything over time can create phase problems. Now if you've done the sub separation trick, then we are in less danger now because the extreme lows are no longer being echoed. But you may still wish to reduce some of the lows in this repeat or the highs depending on how bright your bass is. This effect is a lot more obvious on bright sounds, but it can either work against you or for you. Always check. So that's the dimension trick. Next we've got chorus, chorus plugins. Now chorus is actually very, very similar to what we just did. A chorus is actually a delay plugin, if you didn't know. We have very tiny delays being added back to the signal. The difference is the delay timing is being moved up and down and that creates pitch changes. So it's like having multiple voices play back slightly at different times and different pitches, just like a chorus of voices. So that gives it this swimming effect. Now, just like the dimension trick, because we're adding repeats back to the original sound, we are in danger of phase cancellation, i.e. less bass on our bass sound. So we need to check Ideally, the chorus you're using should let you remove low frequencies from the chorus signal to prevent that, like this one, the free multiply by Akon Digital. Moving on to my most used stereo widener of mono sounds, not just bass, is this. Stereo Touch by Voxengo. This is actually deceptively simple under the hood. Just like the other two methods, this is adding a delay back to the sound, a single delay. Here is the milliseconds for that. The difference here is instead of different repeats in the left and right ear, we have the same single repeat, but that repeat is now out of phase in each ear. 
and that means in mono those repeats cancel and completely disappear. There's only a handful of mono compatible widening plugins on the market, especially freebies, and this is by far my favourite. The rest seem to alter the original sound too much. So that's stereo stuff. If you want your headphone listeners to have a wider sound, try those. Now, let's look at distortion. Distortions. Okay, so here's that Fred again stroke Chris Lake 808 style bass from last week. As discussed last week, 808s are pretty close to a sine wave. They're a sub already. For this track, I didn't use the sub separator trick because this bass is already almost only a sub. There's not much else going on. Now, low warm sounds like this can benefit from some extra harmonics from distortion, depending on how aggressive you need the sound to be. This is all flavor after all. Here is Bedroom Producer's blog, Saturator, with a freebie. I'm using the tape style saturation for this. Now bear in mind, all distortion is, is trading low frequencies for high frequencies. Remember that energy distribution thing I talked about at the beginning? Same deal. The laws of physics do not change. Always keep that in mind, especially on bass sounds. Now, as you might notice, I have compensated the output volume as I add more distortion. That is essential for judging any process, especially distortion, which is now, which is changing the energy distribution of our sound. The ears are easily fooled. Anything louder is automatically better, even if you've made it sound worse. Moving on. Now, if you've got the sound that's already bright, like this, we can get away with more aggressive types of distortion. Now, granted, some of that brightness is coming from the fact that the patch is already distorted, but I thought I would show you what something like a wave shaper would do to this sound. giving us even more aggression and bite or buzz. Again though, watch out for what you are losing as well as what you are gaining. You might be able to hear we're losing a little bit of the weight of this sound. Just to your own tastes. This is a new plugin by the way, it's another freebie called Wolf Shaper. It's a wave shaper, which if you don't know, is effectively like being able to draw your own distortion curves. Now, if you're dealing with a bass that needs to stay subtle and low, your usual distortion options aren't going to do this sound many favors. This bass sounds as good as it does because it doesn't have high frequencies. Adding them with distortion changes its character too much. And also, don't forget, distortion usually destroys dynamics. So if you've got an attacky, punchy bass like this one, distortion is going to delete that. And to those of you trying to jump ahead and say, well, you can always run distortion in parallel, no, that is not the solution. Unless the plugin itself already has a mix knob, you cannot run it in parallel. Distortion changes too many phase characteristics. So what can we do? Well, there's a form of digital distortion. Most people call this bit crushing. Let me show you bit crushing. Bit crushing is basically introducing noise. But what people actually mean when they say bit crushing is sample crushing. We artificially reduce the sample rate. To introduce something called aliasing. As you can hear, 
here that introduces very high frequency ringing, not too dissimilar to ring modulation. And mixed in in subtle amounts, this can help duller basses stand out a little bit without changing their character too much. Now I want to show you the more advanced version of this because the problem with sample crushing is the ringing can last a little too long. And if you want to retain more of the character of the original bass, you only really want the high frequencies at the start of the sound. So this is an effect we can run in parallel to the original signal because we can isolate the super high frequencies which don't interfere with our bass sound. Just grab the frequencies we want So we can mix these in subtly and we can process them on their own. Here I have added a transient shaper so we can add more attack and less sustain. To chop it even further, I've got a gate on that. And now we're only getting sample crushing on the attack of the sound. Okie dokie, that's going to do it for this week. I hope you learned something. If you did, you know what to do. Press some of those virtual buttons that help me out. Or if you're feeling extra generous, there's a link in the description to buy me a coffee. And until I think of a sign-off slogan, I'll see you next week, or I'll see you in the comments. Bye-bye.